Good evening. Um, I'm Crystal Parikh. I'm the director of the Asian Pacific American Institute at NYU. And it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to tonight's event with our artist in resi residence, excuse me, um, Isabel Sandoval. So first, I would like us to take a moment to acknowledge that the APA Institute at NYU is located on the unceded land of the Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We would like to also recognize that New York City is currently home to approximately 100,000 people who identify as indigenous, including many peoples from the Pacific. If you're unsure about whose land you are on, we encourage you to find out. We at the Institute affirm our commitment to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. And today we are offering a few ways to support the na native and, and indigenous communities. This semester, we are highlighting the Maui Cultural, Cultural Center of Lahaina and Indigenous Peoples Day NYC. And links to support their work can be accessed via the QR code, which is uh, available on the slide there. So I'd also like to thank the um, staff of the APA Institute for all of their hard work um, in making tonight's program and every program we do possible. This event is part of our year-long programming um, initiative uh, titled Learning As We Go, in which we ask what it means to learn and teach as and about Asian Pacific Americans. Attacks on critical race theory, diversity, inclusion and equity efforts, and academic freedom pose difficult challenges for teachers and students across the country at the current moment. Yet we recognize that education takes many forms and avenues well beyond academic institutions and classrooms, and this has been especially true in struggles for racial justice. This year, we pay careful attention to the pedagogies and knowledge that our communities have cultivated and share with one another, um, and to, uh, to share with one another and to others across the nation and the globe. With a body of work that examines and imagines the lives of colonized peoples, immigrant laborers, LGBTQ communities, and colonized peoples, oh, I said that, um, in new and exciting ways, we're delighted to have Isabel Sandoval as our artist in residence for the 2023-24 academic year. Um, so just a word about the format of tonight's event. Um, we'll begin with the screening of Isabel's 2019 um, film, Lingua Franca, which will then be followed with the discussion between her and Clint Ramos. And audience questions will be taken on note cards that you should have received. Um, and so now, without any further ado, we present Lingua Franca. Um, and now we get to enjoy um, a discussion, the second part of our program. So, um, so let me uh, introduce both of our, um, our, our panelists or discussants, discussants today. Um, Clint Ramos is a creative director, designer, educator, advocate, and producer. He has designed over 200 theater, opera, and dance productions. Recent designs for the stage include Here Lies Love, K-pop, Slave Play, The Rose Tattoo, Eclipse, Once on This Island, Sunday in the Park with George and Torch Song. His film credits include production design for Lingua Franca by um, Isabel Sandoval for Netflix and costume design for Respect, the Aretha Franklin biopic starring um, Jennifer Hudson for MGM. He is a six-time Tony Award nominee and the recipient of a Tony Award for his designs for Eclipse, making him the first designer of color to win in this category. Ramos is the producing creative director for Encores at New York City Center um, he ser um, and serves on the American Theater Wing's advisory committee and is one of the founding members of Design Action. He's been a lifelong advocate for an equitable landscape in theater and film for black, indigenous, and people of color and for the rights of immigrants. U.S.-based Philippine-born Isabel Sandoval has emerged as, quote, one of the most exciting and multi-talented filmmakers on the indie scene with a bold approach to cinematic style, end quote, according to the Criterion Collection. Meanwhile, the Museum of Modern Art has recognized her as a, quote, rare, rarity among the young generation of Filipino filmmakers, end quote. She has directed three feature films. Her debut, Senorita, um, premiered at Locarno. Um, her critically acclaimed third feature, which you just uh, watched, Lingua Franca, um, premiered in Venice and was nominated for an Independent Spirit Award. She starred in the Cesar Award-winning short film, Mary, uh, Maria Schneider, 1983, uh, directed by Elizabeth Subrin. She has directed for television, including the acclaimed limited series Under the Banner of Heaven, starring um, Andrew Garfield and Sam Worthington, and The Summer I Turned Pretty. 
Sandoval is um, developing her fourth feature, Tropical Gothic, which won a development prize at the 2021 Berlinale. Um, in 2022, she was invited to join the prestigious Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, having demonstrated exceptional accomplishments in the field of theatrical motion pictures. And she is, of course, the 2023-24 um, artist in residence here at the Asian Pacific American Institute at NYU. Please welcome Clint and Isabel to the stage. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Professor Perry, for our introductions. And thank you so much, Clint, for, for joining me. It's a special evening to have you with us. And, you know, I'll go ahead and ask you the first question. Um, how did you, how, what was the experience like working on Lingo Franca, having worked on, you know, theater productions um, on Broadway? How was your <laughs> first foray into film? Um, well, it wasn't my first foray into film because, you know, I, I went to school here yes. and, I, and I majored in, um, in uh, I got my grad degree from uh, uh, Tisch for uh, Design for Stage and Film, but um, it was special. You know, um, when I met you, we met at a coffee shop and, you know, real I realized that you were also from Cebu. Uh, Cebu is a small island in the Philippines in the middle where the Spaniards landed and started their, you know, mayhem. Um, uh, but um, it was very special. It was, um, I, uh, you know, I, I approached it like I approached any other sort of, you know, great work of art. Yeah, I, I feel like, uh, you know, I, uh, I, 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 I didn't really think it was any different than doing um, a play. You know, I read it many times. We spoke about, like, you know, many things. And um, and I just followed that process, uh, I think, throughout the, you know, the pre-pro and into filming, yeah. And, you know, what do you think was the most interesting part of the process? Uh, doing both, you know, production costs and design for Lingua. Yeah, I think uh, that was a, a treat, a pleasure, um, because, you know, I think uh, in the theater, um, uh, it, it's done more often where you design both the scenery and the costumes, right? You're, you're able to conjure up that world and the inhabitants of that world, you know, um, and in a way have some sort of control over um, uh, over that. And, and I think... Uh, to be able to do that on this particular film was uh, um, was special, but also I was familiar with it, right? Like just doing both and just really imagining both the container and the contained um, for um, for your film. Uh, I also felt like um, she was familiar to me, you know. Um, I think we we spoke a lot about you know uh, sort of um, films that felt like. Um, could be uh, influences for the movie, and Jean Delman was one of them. Um, and then uh, I think for me, I approached it like from uh, an emotional response, right? And it was always this sort of solitude, um, uh, this idea of being an island um, in a sea of islands, right? Um, and um, and that was really inspiring, like uh, trying to find, you know, the tension between this immigrant character, you know, who uh, in many ways is othered, right? And is self-othered, right? Um, and, and locating it in an immigrant community that's not necessarily her own. Um, uh, I love that. That was magical, yeah. And, you know, I think Olivia... It's a kind of character, even though I say that it's Lingua Franca is not an autobiographical film, but she's, you know, someone who, you know, I know very well you know, <laughs> psychologically. And yeah. in fact, you know, I think closest to me in that I am an introverted, you know, private, introspective person. And yeah. so those are the kinds of characters that I write. And that's even more, I think, um, Profoundly and palpably so in in Olivia and with Lingua Franca, and you're right in that, you know this whole idea and notion of solitude. You know, yeah, it's a yeah. solitary island, and you know approaching uh, writing Lingua Franca, uh, writing Olivia, um, and Lingua Franca, I really wanted to capture the emotional and psychological state of what it feels like to be in some kind of existential limbo. Because yes. when I first started writing Lingua Franca, it was in 2015, I had just finished my transition. So when I 
finish the first draft, it was a mostly a straightforward romantic drama about this Filipina immigrant, you trans immigrant who becomes involved with the slaughterhouse work, and then halfway through the second draft was when Trump got elected. Yes. And so I feel like you know almost all of us, you know minorities especially, were were plunged into um, this kind of state of anxiety and tension yeah. and paranoia. In fact, I, I put down you know my pen, my laptop for for a few months, uh, and then when I came back to it, uh, went back into writing the script, I really channeled how I felt at that time and distilled that feeling. And that becomes, that ultimately became the predominant mood and atmosphere of Lingua Franca, which is a romantic drama that's tinged in, you know, that existential paranoia. Yeah, no, I, I, we, we talked a lot about this, right? About the sort of immigrant experience too. And, um, and um, this idea that as an immigrant, you know, your identity is based on movement, right? Like you, you move somewhere. And somehow when um, this idea of undocumentation happens to an immigrant, it actually creates stasis, right? Um, and I think that this, this, this sort of beautiful, I think, tension between... Um, uh, identifying yourself as uh, as a person who has moved and also you know in terms of uh, you transitioning and Olivia transitioning, right? Like I think that it, it, there are so many layers of movement and stasis that I think are at play there. Um, and for me, what was beautiful with um, at least the way you've done the film is this, it is ambiguous, right? It is emotionally ambiguous, and I think that's what stasis does, right? Like there is this, um, this, this sort of landscape of ambiguity that's just so ripe for human behavior to observe, you know. And we're just watching human behavior, and uh, and it goes goes back to the gentleman idea, exactly. right? <laughs> and you know what? I also wanted to approach uh, in making Ingo Franca is that, you know, that the themes that it touches on as topical as they are, I'm not the first filmmaker to tackle them um, on the screen, but, you know, I would be one of the few ones who is of the same background as kind of that subject, you know, as, as Olivia. And so I was asking myself, how will I make this kind of film, this particular project, mine in terms of its vision, its sensibility, its... Um, its gaze, yes. so to speak. And I feel that a lot of you know, filmmakers that approach these hot button political issues, namely in this film, uh, Immigration and the Trans Experience, yeah. you know, almost always try to film it from a detached, seemingly objective you know, <laughs> reportorial <laughs> lens yeah. that can be perhaps um, in some ways condescending. Yes. Um, and as if you're looking at this character, this person, as a specimen yes. on a Petri dish. And so I thought for me, you know, a subtle but quite subversive and radical thing for me to do was to actually explore the subjectivity interiority of this character, yeah. which presents another layer of complexity because, again, characters like Olivia and even Alex are really introspective Yeah characters and so i thought you know one thing i could do is especially in the opening sequence of the film is to just place the camera and observe yeah olivia and olga going through their daily routine because you know you think of american cinema for one these characters never get you know more than a few minutes of screen time they're all, always pushed to, per to the, to the per periphery you know of yeah. the frame and literally and also thematically. Yeah. And so I thought it was a bold gesture to just put the camera there and train it on these women silently caring about and going about their daily rituals and announcing that this is cinema. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this yeah, is a valid yeah. subject, yeah. you know, for for cinema and, you know, how much we can get to know about these people by just spending time with them, yeah, so to speak. And to me, because my characters, you know, 
don't really articulate or verbalize how they feel or how they think, you know, a lot. Uh, there is so much to be gleaned from just watching them think yeah. or making coffee or trying to figure their way out, you know, way around the kitchen. Um, yeah. And, you know, again, that inspiration is coming from Jean Delmon. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. By yeah. Chantal Ackerman from, from the 70s. And we, we quoted this film before it was 2022's, you know, Sight, sight and Sounds, like, top film of, like, of all time, right? Um, but I think part of it too. I think we 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 talked a lot about this, um, and a lot of our conversations actually didn't deal with like, uh, oh, what is the bed gonna look like, or what's the kitchen table gonna look like? I mean, we I looked at a lot of like research, right? There was a book, and I forget. I was trying to like cram and like try to find the author of this book, but there was a series of photographs of of Coney Island um, residents, right? Um, and their empty apartments. And it was it was a photographic essay. It was it was very beautiful. I I can send the the the, the credits later. But I think one of the things that we talked a lot about was um, this idea when you know when you describe the film, it's about, you know, a trans Filipina immigrant, right? And um, but even in that description, you're already uh, uh, making her remarkable, right? And, and and to a certain extent, our challenge was how to make her ordinary, you know, um, and uh, ordinary enough that that sort of happy ending or that that hopeful ending is actually ordinary right that it's not a fairy tale and yet she should be entitled to that fairy tale too so it was a lot of these conversations between like well you know what happens to her will she get deported or whatever but no like you know and I, we're in coney island and it's windy and they're laughing and you know they're you know having a good time yeah and also i think you know one thing that i wanted to do differently was to really present and you know showcase this character and all her her layers and facets um you know i feel like a lot of films about immigrants that are being made in the in the u.s or generally is that you know their experience is really reduced to their victimhood you know or marginalization as if that whole that aspect encompasses who they are and yeah. for me you know, like, for example, showing uh, the central scenes, you know, there's two, like, one is kind of their fantasy. Again, where I thought that was an opportunity to explore her inner yeah. emotional and, and sexual life yeah. um, through her imagination. And um, the second one, the, the actual, you know, love scene between her and Olivia was, you know, at first seems like a typical sex scene. Um but then, you know, later on in the scene, we really just focus on her face and the whole gamut of emotions yeah. that she is going through. I mean, first, of course, there's her horniness. <laughs> right. <laughs> and there's um, the creeping, you know, sense uh, of fear and anxiety that yeah. she's uh, becoming intimate sexually with a man who's not aware that she's transgender and who she knows, you know, comes from a background that might need not be the most open-minded. Um, and then ultimately, you know, giving in to that, you know, rush and yeah. uh, and that pleasure. But ultimately, we get to know about her yeah. um, because you know that shot. I think invites the audience to try to understand and interpret. Yeah. what she's thinking and I think one of my you know major epiphanies about tackling character um, with this film is that you know articulating and expressing and manifesting desire yeah from such a character uh, I think at its very core the ability to want something to desire something just the act, you know, itself is, you know, it, it's something active, something that you do. It's an yeah. expression and yeah. I think an assertion of agency yeah. and selfhood. Yeah, because we talk a lot about like, you know, in many ways the character uh, 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 pedals in what, what's, 
what she's allowed to do and what she's not allowed to do, right? And then to a certain extent, um, even the interpersonal choices that she makes, I mean, she's not allowed to leave a country, like, you know, she's not allowed to change her passport, all of that kind of stuff, right? Um, I, 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 but but then, then, then it, uh, how that also relates to the micro choices that she makes, right, in terms of her desire. And, and I'm just really, like, navigating in the question of, like, okay, Let's allow her to do that. I think that to me was, I think to me what was special about like lingua franca in terms of just a sociological study, you know, about Olivia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it's also having you know been born and uh, having grew up in the grown up in the, in the Philippines and really being familiar with you know mainstream or even art house Philippine cinema. You know, a lot of films that touch on political topics tend to be very screechy, you know, and, and melodramatic and quite didactic, you know, when it's, it comes to handling these themes. And, you know, I wanted to go a very different route. I think it's also just closer to my own disposition. Um, I wanted to go subtler and more hushed and more quiet um, because I feel like that way the audience is going to actually lean in closer and pay more attention to the characters by what you're withholding instead of what just you're, you know, blatantly yeah. telegraphing. Um, yeah, you know, Lingua Franca was very, very... I set a lot of some pretty high expectations for myself with Lingua Franca because even though it was my third feature film, in a way it felt like my first because it's my first after my gender transition and... It was my first after, you know, to be set in and produced in the U.S. Like, even though I've already lived here for for a while, I flew back home to the Philippines to shoot my first two features. And so I felt that Lingo Franca would be a kind of calling card for my emergent style yeah. and sensibility uh, as a director. And I'm realizing, you know, I'm a self-taught filmmaker. I did not go to film school, so I don't have a conventional education in film. Um, and in my first two features, I think perhaps coming from the need to legitimize myself as a filmmaker, I was very kind of blatantly um, and very loudly like ripping off influential directors right. to me, like Fassbinder or Wong Kar Wai. And I remember when I was... Uh, commissioning this musical score for my first feature, Senorita, I told my score, I want this to sound exactly like In the Mood for Love. <laughs> Even though the movie was about a trans sex worker who was trying to like rig the local elections. <laughs> but, and so with Lingo Franca, what I noticed um, that was emerging in my style was that you know, I've always been drawn to films with a very strong political underpinning, but this time it's married to a sensibility and an aesthetic that is uh, sensual and sensuous and poetic yeah. and lyrical. And you know, I feel like I found my lane, so to speak, aesthetically and with my future projects, I wanna take that style to even more adventurous and bolder um, heights and um, to a grander canvas. Yeah, I think that's pretty, you know, I think the idea that, you know, there's this filmmaker, Mike DeLeon, right? Um, he, he did all these films during martial law in the Philippines. Um, his films were political, but they weren't about, you know, that. But still, if you look at it, the the if you, if you watch his films the 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 plot lines the acting uh are still really big you know they're really big and and i think to me that was what was refreshing about this idea of sensuality right as a political act but also as a metaphor for like for politics i think what was um i as a filipino i've never seen that and in, in a large way you know we weren't allowed that you know, I think it's uh, not a lot. I think the Catholic sort of thing kind of like made us feel like that's uh, that that if there's any sensuality in cinema, it falls into a certain genre, right? Um, um, and but uh, that 
sensuality again is ordinary is is what i love about like you know the stuff that that you do <laughs> and you know um we are working together again and i'm very yes, very excited <laughs> um for tropical gothic you know my next feature uh Clint is, of course, doing the production design and um, custom design for it. We actually went to the DR. Yes. Um, just uh, to do locations, Scott. We haven't decided yet, you know, um, on the actual location. But Let me tell you something about the DR. The mosquitoes are not like the Philippines, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was intense. Um, but Tropical Gothic, and I've talked about this a few times before, it's set in the 16th century uh, during the early years of the colonial Spanish Spanish colonial regime in the Philippines. And um, I also wear a number of hats, creative hats in this one. I'm going to be playing a native priestess who pretends to be possessed by the spirit of her Spanish master's dead wife just so she can psychologically manipulate him yes. to give her back her property and her farmland. You know, it's only fair, right? So, um, yeah, and, you know, this is also just something that I observe in my own work. I, I tend to pick very specific historical moments yeah. um, because I think that pro provides, like, you know, a very concrete sociopolitical milieu and setting um, yeah. where, you know, these very personal private dramas um, yeah. and power di dynamics uh, take place. And, you know, I thought the period when the Fran Spaniards first arrived in the Philippines is a very fascinating mm. and intriguing one because before they settled in the Philippines, it was really a matriarchal society. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have the native priestess, the local term for this person is the Babaylan, mm -hmm. really. And uh, it tended historically, Babaylans were either, you know, cisgender female or, you know, two-spirit or mm -hmm. trans female. And so, but when the Spaniards arrived, you know, they kind of up upended that mm -hmm. whole social system and hierarchy and it became more and more patriarchal. Yeah. yeah. I'm very excited about that, the, that movie because, okay, let me tell you something. When she first sent me this, <laughs> the script, it was literally prose. <laughs> it was like, it was like pages and pages of just prose. And I was like, where's the dialogue? You know? Um, but then eventually, you know, it became to, it became the draft that we, the current draft that we have right now, which is, it's, it has dialogue and everything. But I think that's sort of what I love about working with you. I think it, it, it is imagination driven first. Right. And, and although I think it's historical, it allows us to imagine it in a very impressionistic way, right? I mean, I'd also, I think as a designer, when you're looking at it, it's also very uh, freeing because not a lot of extant, there's not a lot of extant actually from that period, you know? Um, uh, and everything was seen through the gaze of the Spaniards, right? All of the records were, you know, we have the... Um, the the boxer codex which is like the sort of bible in terms of studying uh, uh pre-colonial philippine society but that was literally you know drawn and described by the spaniards and so to me i think having gotten that 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 first version of of your writing was freeing because it made me conjure up literally a world that's sort of emotion driven right and psychologically driven as opposed to like we need to be historical about this, you know? Yeah, Yeah, I was, you know, I, I, as you said, since the very early, you know, historical accounts that we have of the Philippines, you know, during the Spanish regime where most were written by Spanish historians, I felt like I could take a certain license creatively to really reimagine and reinterpret. And I also didn't want, you know, people to approach this thinking like this is, you know, I'm not making an episode for History Channel. I want them to come away from it thinking that this is a collaboration between Isabel Sandoval and Clint Ramos. You know? Yeah, <laughs> I, I think it's, it's, it's tricky, right? Because Filipinos are very, very um, 
meticulous. Um, and so I think uh, for us, it, it both allowed us to be more imaginative, um, uh, at least in our planning right now. And it, it, it also, for me, creates some room, right, for the audience to imagine what our, what our pre-colonial selves would be, right? I think, you know, we keep on thinking a lot about this idea uh, of like colonization and decolonization. And to a certain extent, you know, um, when we look at works of art that actually are set in pre-colonial times, whether it's the Philippines or pre-Columbian societies, um, uh, there's always this yearning um, to really go back to our pre-colonial selves, but that's impossible, right? And I think part of, at least for me, what's exciting about this particular journey is this idea of um, of our own decolonizing, right? Like this this acknowledgement that uh, that we have to look at all of these layers of colonization through the years, at least as a Filipino, right, in order for us to actually have a sort of clear-eyed vision of the future um, as a society, you know? And I think art contributes so much to that conversation um, uh, because then it becomes this binary of like, you know, who tells whose story. And, you know, speaking of specific historical moments, you know, I wanted to ask you about, you know, you are currently the producer, one of the producers. Of Your Lies Love? Yes. Yes. Written by a white man. <laughs> but also very, you know, cannily set during the the Marcus yeah. Yeah. time in the Philippines. Yeah. Well, the... the Marcus Senior. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The first Marcus uh, uh, administration. How was how was it working on um, a musical and mounting it on Broadway in such a very um, complicated and fraught, you know, <laughs> historical moment for the Philippines? Um, I mean, it is complicated, you know, um, and it it uh, to me, uh, I've been with the project since I don't know uh, two thousand and three. Um, I had just gotten out of grad school. Um, and um, through many sort of connections, I was uh, um, uh, I was introduced to David Byrne, and one of those connections I don't know if she's here was Jessica Hagedorn, um, and um, I I met with him, and he sent me these two CDs. He's like, I'm I'm thinking about this. He's think he sent me these two CDs of literally karaoke tracks, and he was singing all the all the parts, um, but. You know, flash forward to us bringing it to the public during the Aquino administration and also the Obama administration here, right? And then moving it to London um, and then finally bringing it to Broadway in a different different time. Um, it's complicated, uh, but it's 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 uh, it's invigorating, and it's ex it's exactly what I thought it would be, which is like it's really has become a fulcrum for a lot of discourse um, that's beyond the musical, right? Um, uh, discourse around uh, the Philippine condition, you know, and discourse around who gets to tell whose story, um, but discourse on d democracy making, truly, you know, and uh, and and imperialism and racism and all of that, you know, yeah. yeah. And what I most admire, I mean, admittedly, you know, I saw the the musical first at the public theater, and I was initially hesitant to right. watch it, right. you know, now because. Um, the son of the dictator was elected president. But when I watched, eventually watched Here Lies Love, I was really quite taken and impressed by how thoughtfully yeah. you've um, you know, tailored the musical to meet the needs of the current moment. I think it's uh, just very visually stylish, also very embraces the ambivalence that's built yeah. into its DNA. And I feel like, you know, this is what political art should be like. It should be both, you know, entertaining and jubilant, but also provocative yeah. and really asks the right questions for the audience to confront. 
It, it certainly is provocative. <laughs> um, so congratulations. Thank you, thank you. I, and um, no, it's been it's been a it's been a joy. I mean, just on the pragmatic side, it's 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 history making. We have the first all Filipino cast on Broadway ever, um, and um, there's a phalanx of Filipino producers uh, first on Broadway also. Um, and we really looked at it as a, a, a as art making being sort of surrounded by a larger cultural project, you know. Um, uh, and it's it's great. It's like a um, it's it's a challenge to to put something um, both that specific, um, but actually yearn for a larger audience and um, and and somehow uh, in that yearning make it more universal, right? Um, and and when you really zoom out, I mean, to me, the 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 biggest one of the biggest lessons is really about this idea of like uh, this cautionary tale that if we don't um, if we don't watch it, you know, and and we keep on focusing on personalities over principles, uh, um, uh, it could lead us astray. You know? yeah. And history has quite repeated itself many times. <laughs> <laughs> then we have some questions from the audience. Thank you. Um, First question, Isabel, what was the motivation of taking the leap from business into filmmaking? And any advice you um, learned or tips and tricks for people who want to take the leap as well? I think for me, I was always really torn about, you know, going into business. For, for as long as I can remember, I was always passionate about films and and making movies. But growing up in the Philippines, you get this idea or you start to question yourself you know whether filmmaking can be a grown-up you know profession <laughs> or calling because it's beset with a lot of risks and challenges and so I think I went into my undergraduate degree was in psychology actually in the Philippines and then I came here I worked for a year in marketing for a multinational company and then I came to NYU to pursue um, an MBA. But I was also, I specialized not in finance, which is you know the, the specialization of a lot of MBAs, but media and entertainment and marketing. And I actually took a course at Tisch, and I had internships at the likes of Focus Features and the Weinstein Company, but I never met Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then actually, you know, after I finished my MBA, I maybe worked for, you know, a year or two at a digital marketing agency, but that was also the time when I actually took the plunge and, you know, just emboldened myself and started making films and... I, for a while, I was doing editing jobs, you know, for like nonprofits and other commercial projects. And I made two feature films back to back. And then I transitioned and with Lingua Franca, I just put everything into it, I think, um, to really reflect my own growth and evolution as an artist. Um, and I think having undergone my gender transition, I was becoming more genuinely comfortable in my own skin and that translated to my confidence in my yeah. own work as an artist as well. I have to say though, I think part of your um, sort of business background really reflected in when we were making the film because there were moments when we were looking at the budget, right? And Isabel would actually be so limber uh, in terms of like, well, I wrote this thing. I could literally just change it to, so we could make this into this. You know, it doesn't kill the plot, but we could set it differently. We could, you know what I mean? And I think that was that was very helpful. I think, I, you know, I can't imagine any other auteur who would be like, no, you know, I, I think that would have been a temper tantrum. And, you know, it wasn't when I, you know, told my collaborators that it wasn't like I was trying to, crimp my own, you know, um, creativity. But actually, I think I work, I become more innovative and resourceful and um, inventive when I'm working with certain parameters yeah. and restraints, you know, when I'm working with, a, for example, limited budget. Of course, this is a very particular way of working, but I feel like, you know, 
when you write a scene of like writing a whole in my second feature, for instance, it's supposed to be nuns at a protest rally in the streets and you know, we didn't have like ten thousand dollars in the Philippines to like <laughs> you know, make that happen. So I was like, what is the point of this scene? The point of this scene is not the protest, but how it's affecting yeah. these nuns psychologically. So I was you know what? What we're gonna do is we're gonna get um archival footage of these protests in the seventies and have the nun actress sit in a dark room and we're gonna project that archival footage on her face. And we spent fifty bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and I think also that was a creative solution, but it also really created a very specific and heightened, you know, yeah. emotional yeah. space. What I hear you saying, because I think I want to go back to whoever wrote that question, was you know, this idea of like how do you actually, you know, how do you how do you take that plunge? And it seems like you just take the plunge, right? And and um, that's I don't know. I often I often get this question a lot. I've I've not known anything except like art making, you know. Um, but I can't imagine I can't imagine how difficult that is to make that you know to make that um, to make that decision. Yeah, and I think ultimately it all boils down to when you're making your work, especially your early work. Um, and this is how I did it, is how do I make this different from what everyone else is making? You know, um, how do I showcase um, a very distinct and singular and original style that people would then associate with me and my work? Because I feel like in certain ways when you go to film school, because... And there's this pressure and this expectation, you know, to be hired after graduating that we are conditioned or somehow made to think that we need to cater our taste or sensibility to the mainstream. But ultimately, it kind of ends up having, you know, drowning you out um, and blending in. But for me, having been kind of an outsider in that I don't have a tr traditional film background, I was trying to push myself, really. And I only learned, you know, certain... My appetite or my intent in learning the vocabulary, the visual language, and the genres of film is to kind of defy them and, you know, yeah. do my own thing. Yeah. That will that will be different. I'm going to ask you this question because this was on a card. Um, seeing the hovering fear that exists both in Olivia's still and active life as a young trans Filipina, I must ask, does it ever get better? I know it's deep. <laughs> um, you know what's interesting is that here in the U.S., I am... Um, a gold standard minority, gold star minority, right. like a Filipino trans woman of color and an immigrant. But growing up in the Philippines, you know, we were not the other. Yeah. We were kind of the protagonist, so to speak, in the unfolding cinema of our daily lives. And I think having that consciousness and that awareness um, and also growing up a single child of kind of learn to be you know, independent yeah and and headstrong and resilient and a survivor yeah in that sense so i think dispositionally i've i've come to take everything in stride you know in terms of you know what i've had to deal with yeah here and i think what's most important is that because of the different challenges and difficulties that we deal um, as minorities generally is that to really not forget and um, remember kind of the inner resilience that we have. Um, and that's really the note that I wanted to yeah. leave, you know, audiences with in Lingua Franca and that this is... Olivia might be a woman in a very uh, precarious, you know, situation mm -hmm. or predicament, but 
at the end of the day and in the climactic scene, she was able to take back her own agency mm. and pre preserve to a certain degree her her dignity um, yeah and that you know will really have to take you know take it day by day yeah um, every every individual every individual and every person has their own way of you know getting through life and and making do and you know we just have to constantly tap into and replenish those reserves within us yeah I, I sounds very I, Oprah <laughs> I, it feels I mean that's what I love about the movie and it's what I actually really also believe in right like that this question of like does it ever get better um, I think the world will continue to be the trash fire that it is you know what I mean but but the 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 getting better uh, uh, sometimes it's uh, uh, or more often than not we actually have agency over how we get better, you know. Um, the world will continue to be a mess. Um, uh, yeah, I, you know, we can never change or influence the outside world or the outside reality, but we can change how we deal with it, you know, and how we respond to it. So, Isabel, what filmmakers inspired your work? Um, any specific films that have greatly uh, ha have had a great impact or influenced you? Also, any more news on more recent upcoming projects? <laughs> um, yeah, so you know, throughout my cinephilic um, journey, I've had I think brushes and phases with. Uh, like Ingmar Bergman, yeah. of course. In Bergman was really um, a big influence in my second feature, Lingua Franca. Oh, no, apparition about nuns in the yeah. 70s set during you know, the Marcus regime. Wong Kar Wai, of course. Um, kind of just the depiction and portrayal of desire, especially repressed desires. Um, yeah, that car ride is... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, in the mood for love and, of, of course, happy yeah. together as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, Fassbinder, um, Rainer Werner Fassbinder, um, Ali Fear Eats the Soul, and that this ver this star-crossed, elevated romance between you know a German woman and mm. and a North African immigrant uh, was also very important. And you know I've really embraced. Uh, the journey that I've been on as a cinephile because not having gone to film school, my film school was really exposing myself to the works of these international auteurs. And I think that also expanded my horizons in that I don't necessarily just think of the established cinematic canon yeah. you know, that we have, which is very Western-oriented yeah. and um, predominantly male filmmakers and I think you know having curated my own curricula so to speak as a student of cinema has allowed me to you know experiment and try out new things and ultimately I think over the years uh, amalgamated and crystallized into something that is while cognizant of the many influences that I have something that emerged that is uniquely and um fully mine yeah yeah i i mean i love those influences because i think that's uh, a, a, a lot of those filmmakers or the filmmakers that i really uh, that have influenced me right bergman Wong Kar Wai. um i also feel like there's so much um uh, that attracts me to the work that you do uh, particularly about um just this idea of solitude and loneliness you know i just I, I love the interplay with that like there were moments i think in lingua franca that i that it reminds me a little bit of a little bit of um like although it's a different period like la fête de babette you know when she's just going the babette's feast when she's just going through the sort of in the kitchen and all that kind of stuff that it's just 
I don't know. It's just, it's so beautifully observed. And that's sort of what's different about film. Right. Um, and then, and then, the, and the theater, you know, and the theater, it's, um, uh, uh, it's just not ordinary. You know, um, I think there's a way that film kind of grounds the work, you know, with the sort of specific gaze that it puts and it makes it um, beautifully mundane in a large way. A, the a, th a piece of theater will always be theatrical. Clint, I'm so honored to have had this opportunity oh, to I love your chatting with you. Brilliant <laughs> and eloquent mind. Uh, um, same, same. And uh, <laughs> thank you so much um, to you, everyone everybody. for coming tonight. And of course, to the Asian Pacific American Institute for having us and screening Lingua Franca.